Saturday morning, we're going to be on site, but we'll still be broadcasting. And uh, then Saturday evening as well, and we'll continue to give you the schedule. So it's a big weekend, and of course, if you're in the Sacramento area or Granite Bay area, and you'd like to come out and join us on Saturday morning, we would encourage you to do so. We're actually going to be meeting in our new facility, uh, located at 6605 Sierra College Boulevard in Granite Bay, California. And the zip code there is 95746. We're going to be socially distancing, but we'll be able to get together and participate in this special Saturday morning presentation starting at 11 a.m. So if you're in the area, we'd love to have you come. Uh, we can meet you. Amen. Well, Pastor, I'd like to start with prayer, and then we'll get to our study. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this opportunity to open up your word and study, and not only with us here in the studio, but literally around the world. And Lord, we ask your blessing. When your spirit is not limited by place or time, but we ask that your spirit would work in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And we'll be meeting together again as soon as this presentation is over, talking about your Bible questions. And so... If you have any questions on tonight's presentation, we encourage you to send them in. And I think you'll find this uh, subject, based very much on the book of Revelation, a great blessing. Now, our lesson tonight is titled, The Magnificent Kingdom. And we're talking about that subject you find in at least two chapters in Revelation, dealing with the city of God and the home of the redeemed, sometimes called paradise or heaven. But we thought it'd be a good idea to get out on the streets Find out what some American citizens thought about heaven. I do believe in heaven. Um, I'm not perfect. I'm a human being, so I don't know if I'd go to heaven. I would hope so. I believe there uh, has to be a place called heaven, but it may actually be here on earth after the uh, end of the world. I don't believe in the biblical sense of heaven and no, hell. I believe that there is your soul may be trapped in something, but I'm not really sure what that is. Where is heaven? Uh, heaven is above us in, this, in the heavens, in the sky, beyond space. I don't know, in the sky? Isn't it like, it's like up there? In the sky, above us. Not sure. The clouds? <laughs> all of the people in heaven will be different because they will all be good and there will be no evil, and we will all be healed of any anything that we have going on with us. We can only see the good people and we can actually see each other for who we are. And that's how you picture it, you know, it's it's the perfect place. It's where everyone, ex you know, everyone that believes in Christianity wants to go. It's something that is unfathomable. Everybody is happy and says that well, we are finally at peace with ourselves, uh, with the world that we live in. Well, there you have it. There's a lot of ideas about what the world thinks about heaven, if it's real. Is it just high in the sky by and by? And what does the Bible say about this? You know, I thought it'd be a good idea to just go right to the scriptures in the very beginning. And we're going to read what you find in Revelation 21 on this subject of the city of God or paradise. And I'll start with the first verse, Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more sorrow or crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Friends, heaven is for real. And you notice the Bible talked about the new Jerusalem. To understand what it's dealing with, you need to go back to uh, a story that you find in the Bible about King Solomon. Now, at the time when Jerusalem reached its absolute zenith, you can find in the first book of Kings, and it tells us that Solomon was sleeping. First Kings chapter 3, he had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord spoke to him. And he said, ask what I shall give you. And this is something Jesus says to everybody. He said, ask and you'll receive now Solomon could have said, I want riches, and I want long life, and I want fame. But he realized he was a young king, and that he was governing a great people. He had to follow in the footsteps of David, his father, one of the greatest kings. 
And so he asked for wisdom to be a good king and govern the people. God said, since you've asked for this thing, I'm going to give you wisdom, unlike any person who's ever lived before. And he said, I'm also going to give you what you did not ask for. I'm going to give you riches and honor and fame and glory that surpasses all the kings alive in the world. And the Bible tells us that during the time of Solomon, through his wisdom and his careful administration, Jerusalem had reached the zenith of its glory. He built this beautiful temple that was one of the wonders of the world back then. The billions of dollars went into its construction by today's standards. And uh, he built up just a glorious kingdom so that his fame spread everywhere about his supervision, his wisdom, the way he resolved differences. And finally, foreign dignitaries and kings were coming to see him and to bring him gifts and to learn from his wisdom because the Holy Spirit was guiding him. That's where we have that amazing story about the Queen of Sheba. Way down there, somewhere maybe in the area of Ethiopia, Arabia, we're not sure. And uh, she came north with a great caravan. And she brought the presents to Solomon. She said, I had to come for myself. And she went so far. And she brought a great uh, load of gifts. And she said, I wanted to hear about your wisdom. I wanted to see if it was true. So Solomon accommodated her. Unlike what you may have heard in Hollywood, there's nothing in the Bible that there's anything romantic going on with Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. I know it doesn't make for a good uh, Hollywood movie, but uh, Solomon at this point already had uh, 300 concubines and uh, 700 wives, and he wasn't looking for one more. But he did, he did uh, talk to the Queen of Sheba, answer her questions, and show her the kingdom, show her the house of God. He showed her his organization, and her comment after she saw it said there was no more breath in her. Give her the experience where young lady says, he took my breath away. That breathtaking experience you first find when the queen of Sheba saw everything that Solomon had. And she declared to him, you know, when I heard about your fame, I had to come see it for myself. However, I did not believe the words. And this is 1 Kings 10, 7. I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes and indeed, the half was not told me. Don't forget that. She says, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and your prosperity exceeds the fame of which I had heard. Solomon sent her home with more gifts than she had brought. And you know, as we come and we see the son of David, Jesus, not Solomon was the son of David in the Bible, but Jesus is the spiritual son of David. He blesses us with wisdom and knowledge, and he gives us gifts too. She made the effort to seek after God, and she found that if we seek after God, we will find. During the time of Solomon, Jerusalem was so full of gold, the Bible says silver was not counted as anything because it was like stones. There was so much silver in the kingdom. And that's really an echo of the very real gold in the city of God that you find mentioned in Revelation. But we're going to get into that study and learn what does the Bible say about heaven. I think we're going to have fun along the way as we study this very happy subject. What did Jesus promise his people? You can read John 14, 2. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. You know, uh, started out with an amazing fact about a $500 million mansion in Southern California. And it's not even bought yet. Uh, it was built by some investors. And you wonder, who in the world can afford something like that? You know, the sad thing is, I know of millionaires and movie stars that have bought these beautiful mansions, and then they die in some accident, or they die from some disease. It's also temporary. And you think, what profit is it? Jesus is building a mansion for us that is much better than anything on earth that we can enjoy for eternity. Question two. What do we know about this place that Jesus is preparing? He says, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Now, when you say the word heaven in the Bible, and I need to explain this at this point, there's three words that the Hebrews use for heaven. And you maybe heard the expression where someone says, I was in seventh heaven. And, of course, you don't find the phrase seventh heaven in the Bible. You do find the phrase third heaven. But this does not mean that God has a heaven for the bronze and then the silver and the gold rated believers. <laughs> he doesn't have a segregated heaven. When he talks about the three different heavens, in the mind of the Jew, when 
you're reading the Bible. The first heaven was what they call the atmosphere around the earth. You can read there in Genesis where it says God created a heaven, a firmament between the waters and the waters. It means the atmosphere around the earth, where the birds fly and the clouds float. The second heaven was when you look up in space and you see the stars in heaven and the heavenly bodies, it's talking about you know, the galaxies, those are the stars in heaven, this heavenly host, that's the second heaven. The third heaven was the paradise or dwelling place of God. It was headquarters. And so when Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven, he's talking about into the presence of the Father. So I just wanted to clarify that. So when Jesus says, behold, I create a new heaven, you might be thinking, well, is something wrong with the old heaven? No, he's talking about new atmosphere around the earth. This one's polluted, as well as a new planet. For he has prepared for them a city. Now this is uh, not any ordinary city. It's the city of God. Uh, I've seen some beautiful gardens in the world, but the Garden of Eden had to be the best because it was a garden that God planted. And I've seen some beautiful cities, but there's not going to be any city in this world that will compare with the city that God has prepared. Now, we just read in Revelation that said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And people laugh and scoff, and they say, oh man, the Bible this is a fairy tale. How can the city of God come down out of heaven? Well, you know, if you had talked to people a hundred years ago and say, we're going to have a station up in space, they would have said, oh, it's a fantasy. And uh, when they first had the Buck Rogers cartoons about a rocket ship that left the atmosphere and went to another planet, then we all thought that was fantasy. But now we realize it's reality. If you had told somebody a hundred years ago, for the first 5,000 years of Earth's history, that you could be in one side of the planet and you could talk clearly to a person who's on the other side of the planet, they would have said, that's witchcraft, that's impossible. Let alone that you could transmit a picture of yourself while you speak, they would have thought that your telephone device was demon-possessed. But you and I know that it's entirely possible and there's scientific answers for these. So why would we doubt the word of God when he says, yes, I've got a city that's in space that I'm going to bring down to earth. There are so many mysteries we don't understand when we consider how big the cosmos is. You know, some people, uh, they wonder, is there heaven? We heard that articulated in the uh, interviews that we got on the street. Time Magazine, a number of years ago, does heaven exist? You know, I think inherently, everybody knows that we were not designed to die. We are designed to live. Our bodies are made so that they normally heal. Why do they stop healing? Why is it that there are tortoises that live longer than people? Why do humans have 10? That's one thing that you'll find all around the world in virtually every religion. They seem to understand that there must be something beyond this world. Well, but some people say, I'm not so sure I want to go to heaven because I've seen the pictures and you just become a chubby cherub and you sit on a cloud and you play a harp and you look extremely bored. Uh, and, you know, with that concept, you can understand why some people would say, uh, hell sounds more interesting. Heaven sounds boring. Just up on clouds, strumming harps, looking at rainbows and, and you know, shooting Cupid arrows at people that are looking for romance and... Uh, they've got all these very bizarre medieval ideas. Or that when you go to heaven, you become a ghost, a spirit, and you're sort of disembodied, and you go around and you just listen to rapturous music and feel good feelings. No. The Bible tells us that heaven is very real, and we are doing real things there. It doesn't say we're little naked babies on clouds. So we have to find out, what does the Bible teach about this? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And so when we talk about going to heaven, we're really talking about being saved. Now, heaven is a place that is up. It's up there now. But we just read in Revelation, it does not stay up there forever. It ultimately comes down here. Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. And I think I heard a pastor say one time, where the dinosaurs once thundered, sheep now graze. And yes, 
Now it doesn't look like the meek are going to inherit the earth, but things are going to be very different when Christ comes back. The Bible tells us the wicked are going to be destroyed, but the righteous will go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. They will inherit the earth. Heaven will ultimately be here on earth and will do very real things. It says they will build houses and inhabit them. We will plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And so we're, when God made Adam and Eve, God had an original plan. Because of sin, that plan has been interrupted. But the Lord is going to restore his original plan, and uh, it's going to meet out his expectation, his original design. Adam and Eve were doing real things. They were working. They were working in the garden. They probably made, um, I think they probably made houses out of training vines and things, so it was like a living tree house because nothing died back then. So what more do we know about the holy city? Well, we're going to look at several things. These are some of the facts that the Bible gives us. The city lies four square, and he measured the length with a reed, and that's 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, 12,000 furlongs, if you translate that into miles, and you'll notice the number 12 is used frequently in connection with the city of God. Got 12 foundations and 12 gates and 12 kinds of fruit on the tree of life 12 times a year and 12,000 furlongs because 12 is sort of a number for God's people in the Bible. But that would be 1,500 miles. And for those of you in North America, that means that the, the area covered by the city of God is about the size of the state of Oregon. That's uh, like 350 miles on each side. So there's quite a bit of room in there and uh, it's a big city. There's room for you in that city. And then it says the length, the breadth, and the height of it are equal. Now, some are saying, well, when the length and the breadth and the height of something are equal, I got a few students here in the audience. What does that mean? It's called a cube. Yeah. Well, what? Does that mean that the city of God is a big square? Well, when it says the length, the breadth, and the height of it, some have thought it might be pyramid shaped because it means it could mean it's as high as it is wide, and a pyramid technically can be that way. Um, it may mean that it's got just very tall walls. It may mean that's including part of the 12 stones that make up the foundation. And you're thinking, well, that would mean that it would jut right up through the stratosphere into space. When we go on with this presentation, and we are talking about the city of God, please remember, God says that it is almost impossible for you to even imagine what the Lord has prepared. So if I say things and you think, well, that's outrageous, just know whatever I tell you, it is probably even more outrageous than you think. If the Queen of Sheba would say to Solomon, the half was not told me, then at the end of this presentation, you be sure the half is not told you about heaven. Because Paul says that we cannot even imagine the things that God has prepared for those that love him. But I want to give you some of the information because God gives it to us in his word to encourage us that it was never his plan for this world to be so filled with sin and disease and sickness. That's not his plan. It breaks his heart. Now, when you think, will there be room for me in the city? You know, we like to always spread out amazing facts in our presentation. Here's an amazing fact for you. That's Manhattan. That's where I grew up, New York City. And uh, I was parked on the airport in Dallas, Fort Worth. And as we were taxiing, through the, air, through the airport to the runway, uh, my seatmate, he said, do you realize, and it seemed like it took 20 minutes, just a taxi. He said, do you know the DFW airport, Dallas-Fort Worth airport, is bigger than the island of Manhattan? And I'm always interested in amazing facts, so I went home and checked it out, and it is true. But on the island of Manhattan, you've got like 8 million people, and you know, they only go up 20, 30 stories as an average. Another amazing fact, I heard there are more people that live below ground in Manhattan than above ground in the whole state of Wyoming. So the question is, if this is only, you know, 7 by 10 miles, and there's 8 million people, and if the New Jerusalem is a city made by God that's going to be very tall, and if it's 375 miles on each side, I think I said 350 before, it's 375, then there's, city, there's room in the city for you. And so don't worry, will there be enough room in the city? And not only will you have the mansion that you make, you will have a country home that you get to work on. I, John, saw the holy city, 
the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Now, it's interesting that John actually says, I, John, saw. You know, you can read through the whole Gospel of John. He scarcely mentions his name. He only refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He was so humble. But when it comes to telling us about heaven and wanting us to believe, he's saying, I am telling you firsthand, I saw it with my own eyes. God took him away in vision and showed him the city, and he wants you to be there. There is nothing in this world that is worth more than what is going to be in that city. Now, when I normally think of cities, I don't get too excited because uh, cities in the world often have problems. This is, of course, a picture of Jerusalem. And there in the middle, you have the spot where Solomon's temple used to be. And now it's the Mosque of Omar. They call it the Dome of the Rock. But Jerusalem, it seems like it's in the news all the time for fighting. The city of Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt 27 times ever since it was first founded. And the first king of Jerusalem is found in Genesis. He was a man by the name of Melchizedek. And it was simply called Salem then. The word Salem means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. It's kind of ironic that the city of peace has been a place where there's been war after war through history. But the new Jerusalem is going to be different. There'll be no war. Now, I, I've traveled all over the world, and I've been to the biggest city, Shanghai, um, Moscow. Uh, help me, dear. The big cities in India, Hyderabad, and Mumbai, and... Uh, South America and Europe. I mean, I've just been to most of the major cities in the world. Mexico's got 18 million people. Cairo's got 20 million people. I mean, and I don't care much for cities. I grew up in Manhattan, lived in Miami, Los Angeles, born in Los Angeles. Cities typically, uh, I ran away and moved into the mountains because I didn't care much for cities. I'll, I'll share the story with you that I ran away and lived in a cave for about a year and a half. Tune in on Saturday morning. We're going to be talking about that. Because I don't care for cities. Cities, there's so much crime. It seems like a concentration of problems in cities. And the reason being, the human heart is desperately wicked. That's what Jeremiah tells us. And if you've got a concentration of people who are selfish and sinful, you're going to have a concentration of problems. And we see that in the world today. But the city of God is not going to be that way because everybody in the city is going to be filled with the spirit of Christ and have the love of God. And so it's going to be wonderful. The holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God had a wall, great and high, and it had 12 gates. And it tells us that the wall is about uh, 144 cubits, or oh, that's over 200 feet. And some are wondering, well, if the length, the breadth, and the height of it are the same, does that mean the wall is 144 cubits wide and 375 miles tall? Or is it uh, 144 cubits high? And we're not exactly sure, but uh, you get there. We'll explore it together. And it had 12 gates. You know, there are, uh, there's room for everybody to get into the city. And each gate is made out of what? A single pearl. There's a man named Alan Golash. And he was rummaging through a basket of costume jewelry at an antique store in Rhode Island, and he saw this brooch. Well, he had a pretty trained eye, and he thought, this is not just costume jewelry. He went to the proprietor, he said, what do you want for this? He looked over, said, $14. He said, I'll take it. And then he went, and he brought it to a jeweler who looked at it and said, where in the world did you get this? He said, none of your business. He said, what do we got here? He said, you've got a very rare brooch with two cohag. They're like a purple-colored pearls. And it, it, it's called the uh, Venus pearl, a pearl of great price, you might say. And there's three rose diamonds set with gold, and it's inlaid, $14, appraised at over $2 million. And uh, don't you think he was happy? And these are almost perfect large Kohag pearls, very rare. The Bible tells us in heaven that each gate is made of a single pearl. Now, I know someone's going to think, uh, how do you get pearls that big? Where do you get an oyster to produce a pearl that big? God doesn't need an oyster. <laughs> God can make the pearl without the oyster. He can make the egg without the chicken. God can do whatever he wants. And the building of the wall was of jasper. And, of course, it's, it's almost like a beautiful translucent greenish material. 
and with 12 foundations. The street of the city was of pure gold. You know, when uh, you went into the temple of God in the Bible, there was gold everywhere. And it was mostly wood that was overlaid with gold. But uh, when you went into the Holy of Holies, and it was a symbol of the presence of God, that one room that was the inner sanctum of the Hebrew tabernacle was wallpapered with pure gold. And it's telling us this is, you know, the most beautiful material that we know on earth. And there may be something that we don't understand because at one point it says the street is like gold, but it's like transparent. And I think John is looking for words to describe the glories and the beauty that he saw. What does the Bible say about the city's water supply and its food supply? Well, it says, he showed me a pure river of water of life. You know, when uh, you read about the Garden of Eden, it says that from the Garden of Eden, there were four rivers that flowed. And there was the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and uh, I can't remember the name of the other two, but uh, what is it, the Hittichel? And, and they flowed out of the garden, and they irrigated the whole earth. You know, we sing that song, that flows from the throne of God, shall we gather at the river? It tells us that from the throne of God, this water flows. And it basically waters the whole earth. And it's like it says in the last chapters of Ezekiel, everywhere the water goes, everything lives. And the whole planet is going to be bustling with life like a garden. And it's not any water. It's crystal clear water. You know, most of the water, most of the river water in the world, you can't drink. It'll make you sick. If you ever go kayaking down the river, we used to do that. If you're going to camp, you don't want to just drink the river water. You've got to find a creek that runs into the river where you can get the crystal clear water. But uh, you can drink this river water. And on either side of the river, now notice this. On either side of the river was the tree, not trees, a tree either side of the river. Only way you can explain that is this is a massive tree that the branches grow together at the top, making it one tree. Roots probably grow together under the river, and the river flows through it. Now, when I say river, you know, they tell us that where the Amazon flows into the Atlantic Ocean, that it pushes fresh water 100 miles out into the sea. And um, there are places where the river is, you know, 20 miles across. Uh, and uh, I've seen the Mississippi and the Missouri, and there's some big rivers. Think big when you think about the river that's going to water the earth. And so picture a river that could be 30 miles across and one tree that is so massive, it grows on both sides. Now, we live here in California where we've got the redwoods. And I remember the first time I went up and I took a look at the redwoods, and you stand at the base of these trees that are so big that you could you know, drive a wagon with horses through them. Um, and you think, well, this is nothing compared to what God is going to have in the kingdom. So you've got the water supply, and you've got a food supply. It says the tree grows, and it has 12 different kinds of fruit. And it says it bears its fruit 12 different times a year. Now, you all know what that is? In my studio audience, how many of you have tasted durian? About 40%. You know, it's, it's a very controversial fruit. You're not allowed to take durian on an airplane. You really aren't. You can, you can wrap it up, maybe put it in your luggage, but you can't take it in the cabin because it has such an overwhelming smell. It smells a little bit like dirty socks. I don't know what else to tell you. But it's like, you know, bananas don't smell so good on the outside like if they're in your garbage can, but eating bananas is okay. Well, durian has a very unique flavor, and those who taste it either love it or hate it. The people who live in the places where it grows say that it, it smells like Hades. That's not the word they use, but it tastes like heaven. And I've had durian, and it is a very good fruit. It's delicious. But the tree of life, and you know, it's fun when you travel around the world. I see so many strange, exotic fruits. I can't wait to eat from that tree of life. It has some essence, some enzyme that keeps our cells from dying, that will forever be renewed by it. Adam and Eve ate from that fruit. They ate that fruit from the tree, and they lived 900 years. But as their posterity got further and further away from that, lifespans actually shortened. And it yields her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So it's got 12 different kinds of fruit, 12 times a year. I used to work for Baskin Robbins ice cream. We always had at least 31 flavors. Uh, this one's got 144 flavors. And I figure every month, people are going to be coming to find out what the new flavor is of the fruit. You'll never, ever get tired of eating it. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. People read that verse, 
and they say, who needs healing in heaven? Why would you, people get sick in heaven? Is there a disease? And, you know, I think it's telling us that as we gather around that tree to eat, all the nations that are divided here in this world, we're divided by customs and cultures and races. But as we gather as one family under that tree, all the divisions are healed. It doesn't say healing of sickness. It says healing of nations. So we all become one nation as we gather under that tree. I like amazing facts about trees. This is the baobab tree that you can find in Africa, and they call it a tree of life because virtually every part of the tree is edible or drinkable. It's a tree that swells up during the raining season, and its spongy bark absorbs a lot of water. That They often have holes that are dug in the side where different animals go in and drink the water. It can save a person in drought. The small leaves can be eaten like spinach. The fruit is very nutritious. The seeds are edible. The bark can be used to make clothing. And so the locals call it a tree of life because every part of it can be used. Well, the tree of life that God's made is going to help us live forever. How will living in heaven be different from living here on earth? Well, it tells us a lot of wonderful things. You know, people suffer from disease here. It says the eyes of the blind will be opened. Now, uh, I, I whine and complain because I used to have like 20-10 vision. And Karen says, you've got no problems at all because she wore glasses when I married her. She's always struggled with uh, her vision. Now her vision's better because she had the surgery. And, but now my vision's going. And I think, oh man, I can't wait to get to heaven because every eye will be like binoculars. And you'll be able to see like an eagle. It says the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Our hearing will be intensely better. And the people who are suffering with disease in this world are all going to be made whole there. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart. A heart is a deer-like creature. You see the gazelle hopping, you know, 50 feet in a, in a leap. I love watching those uh, movies of when they first walked on the moon. And did you see them walking on the moon with very little gravity? They're wearing these heavy spacesuits, but they look like ballerinas. They go boing, boing, boing. And I thought, oh man, that's so great. We're going to have that kind of elasticity where we're going to feel light. And the tongue, tongue of the dumb will sing. People who can't even talk here are going to sing on key there. And I can't wait to get to heaven just to be able to sing on key. It says they will not hurt or destroy. You know, in this world, a lot of the animals, they're, they're, all the creation has been corrupted. You know, the plants brought forth thorns and thistles. That was never God's plan. And animals began to kill and eat each other. And mosquitoes, who probably used to pollinate, started sucking blood. And everything went bad because of sin. But everything is restored. The Bible says the lion will lie down with the calf. And a child will play by the hole of a venomous serpent. And they will not hurt or destroy. And a little amazing fact I thought I'd share with you. Um, these are, yes, it is like a Wizard of Oz, lion, tiger, bear. They call them BLT. They were rescued as cubs that lived together in the house of some drug lord that was raided in Atlanta. He had bought them. They were living in absolute squalor. The animal authorities took them and they gave them to an animal refuge called the Ark where they are living happily together. And they love each other. And they play together. And they wrestle. And they groom each other. Well, normally, you'd think they'd be enemies. But uh, in heaven, it says the lamb will lie down with the lion and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Nothing is going to hurt in heaven. There'll be nothing dangerous there. The wolf will dwell, here's the verse in Isaiah eleven six. the wolf will dwell with the lamb and a little child will lead them. You'll never be afraid when your child says, I'm going to go play in the jungle, mom and dad. I'm going to go play in the woods. You say, have fun. There'll be nothing there that they have to be afraid of. The desert will blossom like the rose. You know, places in the world today that are uh, you know, stark and barren and desolate, it's all going to be beautiful there. And the most desolate places in the world will be better than our best gardens now. And so everything is going to be beautiful and symmetrical and just uh, totally mesmerizing to the eye. There the thorns will have no, or the thorns, the roses will have no thorns in that kingdom. The inhabitant will not say, I am sick. I'm looking for, for a world where nobody gets sick. We don't have to worry about these invisible viruses and bacteria because there'll be nothing that's going to hurt us there. We won't have to worry about our loved ones getting old and dying because everyone is going to be mounting up with youth, with the, like wings of an eagle. 
There'll be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, no loneliness, no separation. Uh, isn't that a good place to say amen? amen. <laughs> We're looking forward to that. What kind of bodies will the saints have there? Well, the Bible tells us. It says, then the Lord Jesus Christ will change our vile bodies, these bodies that they get old and they die and they age, and that they might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So then the big question is, it says our bodies will be like his body, meaning after he rose from the dead. What kind of body did Jesus have? Is Jesus' body real or was he a spirit? Look in the Bible. After Christ rose from the dead and after his crucifixion, he appeared to the disciples several times. When he saw them, you know, first they thought they saw a spirit because he suddenly appeared. And uh, he said, look, behold my hands and my feet. See the scars? That it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. He said, touch me. And then to punctuate that he was real, he ate in front of them. Several occasions he ate in front of them and he, he got hungry. See, in heaven, Adam and Eve had glorified immortal bodies before sin, but because of sin, they began to age. They could no longer eat from the tree of life. They were evicted from the garden, and uh, they began to basically, their bodies were what you call corruptible, aging bodies. But Jesus had a real body. God's design for man and woman in the world was to do real things, and he's going to accomplish his original plan. What other encouraging promises are found in God's word? It says, and he will send Jesus Christ, who the heavens must receive until the restitution of all things. Now, restitution means, well, it means an upgrade. I was uh, traveling, uh, speaking, and I remember I went to the St. Louis airport and I got a rental car. And when I went in to get the rental car, it was late at night, and there was one girl there at the counter, and she looked at me and she said, are you on TV? And I never know quite what to say, because I remember once I said, yes, and they said, you're that car salesman that comes on real late, aren't you? I said, no, that's not me. So I said, yes, and she said, amazing, I said, that's amazing facts. Oh, I love your programs, and, and she was very nice, and then she kind of looked around, and she said, let me give you an upgrade. I said, oh, well, that's very nice. Um, she, she said, how'd you like a convertible? I said, well, it's snowing out right now. <laughs> and she said, uh, oh, yeah, what was I thinking? She said, ah. She says, we've got the executive car. No one ever takes the executive car. I'm going to give you the executive car because the car we normally were going to give you, it's not here, so we're giving you an upgrade. We're going to give it to you even better. We've got a Cadillac. It's got a heated steering wheel. You're going to really like it. I thought, oh, heating steering wheel. That's for wusses. We need heating steering wheel. Well, you know, I got in the car and I tried it out. I thought, well, this is pretty nice. It warms up your hands right away. But then I felt a little self-conscious because here I had this fancy Cadillac and I pulled up to this humble church to preach. And I thought, oh, this isn't going to look good. They're going to think Pastor Doug is using company money to, to you know, travel in style. And so I, I parked as far away from the church as I could and hoped nobody would notice me getting out. But when I got out to lock the car, I pressed the panic button instead of the lock button, and the car started honking. And all the members in the parking lot turned, and they looked, and I went, oh, man. <laughs> Don't you know your sins will find you out? Anyway, but, you know, sometimes we get an upgrade. And I remember when Karen and I went on our honeymoon, uh, we, we took a cruise through the Panama Canal. It was a beautiful boat. It was very nice. But we were so excited when the travel agent called and says, you know, she was actually a friend. She says, I, I've talked to the, the line, and there was one luxury suite. We've upgraded you. There's only one suite ahead. You've got a room with a balcony. And oh, I was so excited to take Karen because I love her. I wanted to give her the upgrade and show her that. Well, Jesus is going to give us a major upgrade. The Bible says he's going to restore all things, not as they were, even better than they were. He's not letting the devil ruin his plans. We're not going to look at the world for eternity and say it was a lot nicer before the devil messed things up. We're going to look at it and say it's even better than what God had made originally. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, the ones who live in that city. Now here's the point, friends. If you want to follow the Lamb there then, you must first follow him here now. And so this is where we begin the practice of following the Lamb if we want to follow him 
in that kingdom made new. Will sad or painful memories from this life trouble the people in heaven? No, the Bible says the former will not be remembered nor come into mind. Now that's not because in the resurrection we don't remember that God has saved us. It's not going to be because we've forgotten what Jesus did in his sacrifice for us. It's going to be because the glory of the world that we see is going to be so brilliant, so splendid, that it is going to completely eclipse the painful memories. You know, it's like that scripture in the Bible where it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And the Bible tells us that a woman, when she's laboring, and she might be howling and in pain as she's getting ready to deliver that baby, but as soon as the baby comes, she's forgotten about the pain because she's rejoicing with the baby. And that's what it means when it says, these will not come into mind. But we'll never forget what Jesus paid for us because through eternity, he will have the scars in his hands. Will people from earth recognize each other in God's new kingdom? We get this question frequently. Folks are wondering, well, you know, when I get to heaven, uh, grandma, you know, she was 90 when she passed away. And uh, how am I going to spot her? I'll be roaming around heaven looking for grandma among the millions of people there. Well, the promise in 1 Corinthians 13, this is that chapter that talks about love. It says, then I will know even as I am known. You know, when you have a friend, uh, what you know and appreciate about that friend is not just what you see on the outside. There's a character, there's a, a spirit that's on the inside. And we're going to know them, we're going to recognize them for the essence of who they are. And the thing to remember that in heaven, we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are we going to have less discernment? No, we're going to have more discernment. We're going to have spiritual discernment. And so we'll right away look around. We're going to recognize people we may have barely known in this life. We're going to know just who they are. And we're going to be very excited that they shared our faith. What other thrilling promises does God give us regarding his coming kingdom? There's several things here. It says, The ransomed of the Lord shall come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy. What's your favorite verse, Karen? Psalm 16. Psalm 1611, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so the Bible tells us that there's joy in heaven. There's, there's going to be different levels of joy, but you're never going to have the sadness and the pain that we have in this life. There are pleasures forevermore. There's your verse. I thought it was in there. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing, Zechariah 8.5. There will be children in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean they stay children forever. Because, you know, God makes children to grow up. But some who maybe died or were uh, translated when Jesus comes, there may be some still children. They'll get to heaven. They'll still have glorified children bodies, but then they grow up. I just think they're going to grow more slowly. There's a verse in the Bible that says a child will not die till it's 100. What that means is a child will not cease even being a child until they're 100. You look back in the Garden of Eden, people didn't get married until they were 100. And so as we enter eternity, we'll enjoy watching these children grow, and it will happen more slowly. But yes, there are children in heaven. They'll be babies in heaven. Many parents will be reunited with children they lost in this life in the world to come. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. We will have just eternal vigor. There'll still be times for rest, but it'll be pleasant. It won't be like the exhaustion that we feel now. They will mount up with wings like eagles. There's a gospel song that talks about this verse. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. I was flying with Karen. I'm a pilot. And we were flying once. I was in Colorado. We were going at 14,000 feet. And I thought, you know, we we're just way up above the clouds. And I passed an eagle. And I thought, how does he get up this high? Why does he even want to go this high? So far above the mountains and everything. And they just enjoy flying. He was just catching the thermals and going as high as he could. It's just telling us that we'll have that strength and that energy. Can we adequately describe God's new kingdom with words? Well, this is the verse I was sharing with you in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye has not seen, that means the eye of any man, nor the ear heard, neither has entered into the heart or the imagination of man the things that God has prepared for those that what? Love him. What's the key to enjoy these things? We need to love the Lord. What's the highest reward of God's new kingdom? 
God himself will be with them. You know, because of sin, God used to talk to man in the Garden of Eden. And in the beginning, after Adam and Eve sinned, it says they fled from God. God did not run from us. God has come after us. You know, the first question in the Bible is God saying, where are you? Actually, the first question is the devil questioning God's word. He said, hath God said? Then after man sinned, the first question God asks is, where are you? First question in the New Testament is God, is man saying, where is he? The wise men looking for Jesus. We have been separated from God because of sin. Jesus came into the world to provide a ladder. Jacob dreamed about a ladder that joins earth and heaven to bring us back together again. And that's the whole idea. We want to be in the presence of God. And when people think about what's the most glorious thing in heaven, you know, I, I'm looking forward to traveling to other galaxies and solar systems. And I mean, I, I love travel. I love exploring. And uh, some people say, kids say, oh, I can't wait to wrap my arms around the neck of a lion and sink my fingers into its mane and not be afraid or slide down the neck of a giraffe or go water skiing on the sea of glass. I don't know. Just everyone's got these different dreams about how wonderful it's going to be in heaven. But, you know, really, it's all going to be summed up. The greatest joy is if you're in the presence of the Almighty Creator. Think about how big space is. And he's saying, I am going to move the capital of the universe to this planet that had rebelled against me to show that I love and I've accepted and forgiven them. And that is the greatest honor, that we could be in his presence and be with him. And what would be worth more than that? Nothing. 14, what will exclude people from God's kingdom? There's one thing that will keep us out. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defiles. We must be forgiven and cleansed from our sins. Jesus came to save us from our sins. And he can and he will and he wants to. He can make you a new creature and your life will be better. Now, the abundant life does not begin when Jesus comes. For a Christian, the abundant life begins now. And so when you accept him, you get a joy. Joy is not just in heaven. There's joy now. Christ said that we've got a joy. We have a peace now. Don't have to wait for heaven. And I don't know how we can have peace without God. The Bible tells us that um, he that overcomes will inherit all these things. The question is, what do I do about sin? Answer, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so many people are trading eternity in heaven in a world with glorified bodies where there's joy, bliss that you can't imagine. Every sensation would just be throbbing with joy in heaven and they sacrifice it for so little here. God is offering us eternal joy forever and people are giving it up now and they don't even enjoy this life. Just follow me for a moment. Imagine that um, someone came up to you and they said, I'd like to give you a check for a billion dollars. And you'd go, well, I'm interested. Let's, let's hear more. And they say, well, the only thing is that you get a billion dollars and you can take that money and you can go to Las Vegas and you can spend it for whatever you want for a year. And you go, yeah. And then you see, after the year, you get thrown in a lake of fire, get burned up. You'd say, uh, that sounds enticing. There might be a few strange people that would say, yeah, but I don't know why you would ever say yeah to that because you'd be thinking after your first day with your new credit card and all the earthly pleasures at your disposal, you'd go, I got 364 more days and then the fire. Next day, I've got 363 days and then the fire. Yeah, I'll go to another movie. See how much you enjoy that movie. I'll go to another show. I'll go visit the bar. Just going after all the pleasures that are in Sin City. Now, I'm sorry to my friends watching in Las Vegas. I know there's some nice people in Las Vegas also. But, you know, you got a reputation. And anyway, so how could you enjoy it? But that's the way so many people are living now. They're day by day. It's not a year. It might be 70 years, 90 years. But they're basically sacrificing eternity for the temporary pleasures of sin. The Bible says Moses walked away from being a ruler in the richest kingdom in the world, Egypt, back in his day, refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, willing to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He said, this is temporary. 
Abraham looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Why would we want to sacrifice what God is offering us when this is also temporary? The question is, do you believe? It's like you ask a child, would you rather have one ice cream scoop right now or an ice cream scoop every day of the week a month from now? So many of them will say, I want one scoop right now. They're not thinking because they're immature. But a lot of the world are making the same decision. We are sacrificing eternal life. Now it's true. Sometimes there's struggles in life. There's struggles if you're lost. There's struggles if you're saved. Everybody's got problems. It's a lot better for a Christian. But how much better to do the hard thing now for a little while and enjoy eternity forever in the future? And Jesus said, yes. If you follow me, you will have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and there'll be some struggle. But there's joy. Christianity costs something, but it pays a lot more than it costs. Why would we want to miss that, friends? What did Jesus say is the formula for success in this life and in the next? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. This is the priority for happiness. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now, it's not just about being in heaven. The whole kingdom of God is really about Jesus. It's about a person. It's about a love relationship with somebody. Everything else is really just the trappings. But the, the main idea is he wants to show you that he has something so much better for you. A desire to avoid hell and go to heaven is a suitable starting point for a believer. But as you mature, it's not going to just be about avoiding hell and wanting heaven. It's going to be about wanting to be with Christ. That's going to make the difference. You know, I'm reading through a book right now that I'm finding fascinating. It's on the, the life and journeys of Marco Polo. And uh, it's incredible how this young Venetian boy, he was like 18 years old when his father and his uncle took him on their second journey to the Mongol Empire, which was one of the biggest empires in the world back then. And because of circumstances and politics, they could not return home. He ended up living 20 years. He became friends with the great Kublai Khan, the, big, the most vast empire in the world back at that time. And he saw things that are just so phenomenal. He said, yeah, he's got a private herd of 400 elephants and 10,000 people feed at his table every day. And he sits on this golden throne above it. And as he described the wonders of China, he talked about this wall over a thousand miles. It turns out it's 1,500 miles. Over a thousand miles long. He talked about paper money. He talked about a postal system where they could deliver messages hundreds of miles in two days. And, and the people in Venice, when he returned, first they thought it was amazing. Then they said, you're crazy. And then they said, you're lying. And Marco Polo, he says, they dig rocks from the ground instead of wood and they burn. They use them for fuel. <laughs> they didn't know what coal was. They said, how can that be? And he was telling them about gunpowder and all the wonders of China. And they said, you're mad. Finally, as Marco Polo lay dying, he's over 70 years of age, uh, his friends and some of the priests came to him and they said, you're going to meet your maker soon. Don't you think you should repent of these wild stories you've been telling of the Mongol Empire and the land of China? He said, repent? He said, I have not told you the half of what I've seen. And friends... No matter how long I talk about the subject of heaven, I could never even come close to telling you a fraction of what God has prepared for those that love him. Why would you sacrifice all of that for the temporary, unsatisfying pleasures of sin for a little season? It's just not worth it. And especially when someone has given their life and poured out their blood that you might be forgiven and be in that kingdom. Don't you want to make that choice? You know, Jesus is making it possible for you not to have an earthly kingdom and not like the Mongol Empire but it says blessed are the meek they will inherit the earth and he has a place for you he's building a mansion for you wouldn't you want to be there when he's paid so much to purchase your fare I'd like to pray with you before we close and you can tell him yes loving Lord we just want to thank you for the promises that you give in your word for the wonderful pictures that you give as well as a, an earthly mind can comprehend the glories of the world to come. And Lord, it is our desire that we might be cleansed by the blood of your Son, that we might have a place in that kingdom. Forgive us for our sins. Some here, Lord, have not made decisions to trust their lives to you. Help them realize what profit is it if they gain the whole world and lose their soul 
or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I pray they'll make that wise decision now to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Bless them with peace and joy, an abundant life here, and eternal life in the world to come through Jesus. In his name we ask. Amen. Now don't go far, friends. Pastor Ross and I will be back in just a couple of minutes to answer your Bible questions. To Revelation now, and we're going to be taking your Bible questions. We want to thank many of you for sending in your Bible questions. The presentation tonight, Pastor Doug, was on heaven. A lot of the questions are relating to that. And I'm going to, um, before we go to the questions that we put on the screen, I found one question that I thought was just so very important, and uh, I want to ask it right away. Are you ready for this one? I don't know. This is a real question. We didn't make it up. It said, Will Pastor Doug have hair in heaven? <laughs> Well, I could say that about Pastor Ross, too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've got this personal opinion that uh, actually uh, hair is a result of sin on top of a man's head. <laughs> the Bible says Samson, he got into trouble because of his hair, and Absalom got into trouble because of his hair. But Elisha was translated, and it says, go up thou bald head. So, you know, you may have your beliefs, but... <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> there we got it. All right, well, we're going to look at some of the questions that we have. We'll put up uh, our first one. It says, uh, how can heaven be a happy place when the saved think of loved ones who are lost? How can heaven be a happy place when you think of the lost? Well, you know, at first I think during the millennium that there's going to be a period of sadness. Uh, you notice it says in Revelation that it's not until Revelation 22, I believe, where it says God dries, wipes away, or it's Revelation 21 after the millennium, mm -hmm. God wipes away all tears from their eyes. And so during the millennium when we have questions to ask and we say, you know, why is this person not there? And we're probably going to say, why is this person there? I think we're going to have some surprises in heaven. Pastor said there's three big surprises. One surprise is we're going to see people there we never thought would make it. Another surprise is we're going to see people missing Mm -hmm. that we thought for sure would be leading the parade. And then the third surprise is that we're there. And, and so um, we'll have a lot of questions, but then there may be some sadness during that time. But uh, in Revelation 21, it says, God wipes away all tears. This, of course, is after the wicked are judged. And that whole sad episode, episode is behind us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, our next question is, is the apostle Peter in charge of the gates of the holy city? You might have heard people talk about the Apostle Peter standing at the gates of uh, the New Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, uh, that's basically from mythology that, um, that Peter is guarding the golden gates. I don't know where that first originated. <laughs> you know, I think it's because of that verse where people have often misunderstood where he said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Hmm. That somehow Peter's got the keys to the gates and that everybody that gets in has to go by the Apostle Peter and he's there with a big clipboard and a pen behind his ear. And he's checking off, you know, who, who's been naughty and who's been nice. I don't know. But it's, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> right. That judgment takes place. It's God's. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God, not of Peter. Okay. We've got another question. And that one is, will babies who die be saved in God's kingdom? Yeah. Well, every child that dies before the age of accountability, especially of believers, and you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it tells us that the children of believers are sanctified by the faith of their believing parents. And so if a child should die before the age of accountability, and again, we don't know exactly what, the Bible doesn't say an exact age, but when they're old enough to understand the consequences of right and wrong and, and their decisions, uh, I believe that they are saved. And uh, well, as I mentioned in the presentation, many parents are going to have their uh, children brought to them by angels in the resurrection and be restored. Okay. All right, we're going to get to some of the questions now that uh, have been sent in. And we start with an important question. How do I get my first love back for Jesus after I've lost it? Yeah, a very good question. In Ephesians, I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 2, it talks about the church of Ephesus, which um, the uh, criticism Jesus has of that church, he says, you've lost your first love. And he said, I counsel you to repent and return and remember the first work. So 
sometimes uh, we need to remember that uh, the, the appreciation that we had for Jesus when he forgave our sins, that hope, that joy, that experience, and we find it the same way we found it the first time, mm -hmm. is we repent of our sins, we look in his word, we remember his promises, we remember the, the contrast. You know, as in marriage, often there is a certain, um, there's a sparkle during the dating courtship time. There's a novelty, as it should be, because it's something new, it's a new relationship. But, you know, you should never lose that, uh, that spark of love and appreciation. And uh, the Lord wants us to have that same commitment that we had the first time. Okay. Uh, another question that we have, are we going to have wings like the angels in heaven? You know, I think there's some verses. We, we read that verse there in Isaiah. It says, we'll mount up with wings like eagles. And, you know, I like that song, Rock of Ages. It's got a verse in it that says, we will soar to worlds unknown and see the all night judgment throne. There's no specific verse that says that, but I believe it's true. Uh, but it does say there that, you know, they'll have angels, uh, that uh, they'll mount up with wings like eagles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we don't know how angels fly. I mean, Daniel's praying and Gabriel comes from heaven and he appears in just a matter of minutes. So angels, you know, speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. Speed of sound is roughly, depending on your uh, air pressure, 700 miles an hour. Then you get the speed of thought. And so angels are traveling a whole speed that physics is not even aware of right now. But I think God's going to give us the ability to think ourselves off the ground. Mm -hmm. Kind of like in Peter Pan. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question that we have. If we, get, um, if we don't get old in heaven, what age will we be forever? And do we get to choose that age? Well, you know, even those who are saved... I think we'll grow some when we get our glorified bodies and we get to heaven. Adam and Eve lived much longer than the average person. I think Adam and Eve were not shorter. We didn't descend from monkeys that dragged their knuckles. I think that Adam and Eve were bigger and more noble. And the Bible talks about people being taller. And um, I think we're going to actually grow up to this perfect age of maturity. But, you know, we're not, I don't think we're going to have any of the, the, um, side effects that you see when you start, everyone talks about once you get past 29 and you get into your 30s, you start since the aging process, you're sort of in your prime, they say like 29 or 30. So I don't know, we're, we're going to feel perfect vitality and youth forever. All right. We'll be happy whatever that age is. Uh, another question that we have is Genesis chapter 6 talks about giants on the earth. Where did they come from? Yeah, well, I think as I just mentioned, the original uh, Adam and Eve in the beginning were much bigger. Not only did, you know, it's not until the flood. We have a presentation that's coming on Revelation, talks more about this, but following the flood, uh, the lifespan began to decline, and we think also man's stature changed at that point. But when the children of Seth intermarried with the children of um, Cain, it says their offspring were especially robust and uh, very tall, uh, but even by the time of David, after the flood, you've got Goliath, mm -hmm. and you've got not only Goliath, you had a whole nation of giants in the book of Numbers that talks about the Anakim, and uh, there was one king that was bigger than Goliath. It says his, his bed, doesn't tell you how tall he was, it says his bed was uh, 13 feet by our standards. And so, and it, the, uh, the spies that came back and talked to Moses, they said, looking at the Anakim, we felt like grasshoppers. And so there were some big races of people that uh, survived even the flood until the genetic, <laughs> genetic vitality diminished and we all kind of got stubby. Okay. <laughs> the next question that we have is, um, you mentioned the gates of the New Jerusalem, that there's 12. The question is, what is the significance of the number 12? You know, that, that is another thing that some people have thought that John was inspired when he wrote Revelation because the mathematical numbers that he used are beyond what a fisherman would normally know. Uh, carpenters realize that 12 is a perfect number for construction. And there's a reason that when you used to say they're 12 inches in a foot, it used to depend on the foot length of the English monarch. And they said, we can't use that. We've got to find a perfect measurement for construction because it was making too much confusion. 
So they ended up dividing it up into 12 inches because 12 is divisible by 1, by 2, by 3, by 4, by 6, and by 12. And so for construction, it's like the perfect number. And it's a symbol for God's church. Mm -hmm. And, it's, you know, the dimensions of it are just really uh, remarkable when you think about it. Okay, another question that we have is, uh, is there going to be an ocean and sea creatures in heaven? Well, you know, Revelation tells us, and is that, Pastor, you might need to help me, is it Revelation 22 where it says there was no more sea, or is it Revelation 21? And when he says there's no more sea, I don't think he means there's no more large bodies of water because rivers all run to something. And so I do believe those rivers that flow from the throne of God will empty into a beautiful body of water. But the sea that we know now, since the flood, the water became briny, full of salt. It's a border that separates, and there'll be nothing that separates. There'll be no, in, there'll be no wild sea that has the uh, storms, and, and it won't be water that can't be swam in without stinging your eyes or drinking it without making you sick. So when it says no more sea, it means no more sea like we have now. And I think the verse you're referring to is Revelation chapter 21, it's verse 1. Oh, it is, okay. It talks about a new heavens and a new earth, and there was no more sea. Yeah. It's after the millennium. Um, another question that we have is, what is the unpardonable sin? Well, before I answer, I'll mention that uh, there are several verses you could look at on this, but uh, we do have a book, a free book you can look at online that by that title, What's the Unpardonable Sin? But uh, put simply, it's when a person comes to the place through perpetually resisting the voice of God, the volume of the Holy Spirit goes down so you can get to the point where you just do not hear the voice of God anymore. Mm -hmm. Most people who worry about that they've committed that probably haven't. A lot of people call our radio program and they say, I'm afraid I've committed the unpardonable sin. And we, we know that if they're calling, it's because the Spirit's working on them. Mm -hmm. It's probably not happened. But when you get to the point where, like Judas, you've just grieved away the Spirit of God or Saul when he, he ends up going to a witch instead of going to God, uh, and Judas was willing to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, you can reach that point of no return. And, uh, of course, a person reaches that when they die. Mm -hmm. Their sins cannot be forgiven. But some people reach that during their lives through persistently hardening their hearts to God so they've left no, they have no more redeemable qualities, basically. They've grieved the Holy Spirit through just turning down the volume so they have no conviction anymore. Okay. Uh, another question that we have is maybe a child's asking this. Are dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible and will they be in heaven? Well, I think God's going to have a lot of creatures that will be in heaven. You know, it already mentions, it says there's animals there. It's talking about the lion and the wolf and the lamb and the snake and, and uh, bear. They're all mentioned specifically as being in heaven. I'm sure a lot of animals that are extinct now are going to be in heaven. Things we may not know about. Um, you know, there were giant reptiles, and many of these may have been part of God's original plan. God made a serpent. Serpent was not a bad thing when God made it. It was after it was possessed by the devil. There will be maybe some very large dinosaurs. And, you know, so many of the artist recreations of the dinosaurs, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist, and I knew all their names. They were all gray and green and drab, and I thought, boy, they're ugly. But then the artists started getting more creative, and they realized, you know, reptiles in this world have beautiful colors. And it's like, you get a stegosaurus and you put some color on it, that's a remarkable creature. And so um, I think that there's going to be some animals that uh, will, what we call dinosaurs, they have, uh, Bible talks about flying reptiles. You know, the world talks about dragons. There, there are pterodactyls and pterodactyls and flying reptiles. I think we're going to be amazed at all kinds of creatures, but none of them will be terrible thunder lizards. That's what dinosaur means. Nothing that's going to hurt us in heaven. Okay, very good. And is, does the it's Bible say... It's not going to be like say, Jurassic Park where people are getting are gobbled getting? up by dinosaurs, yeah. <laughs> does the Bible say anything, or is there any reference in the Bible to a dinosaur? Um, well, you've got that verse where it talks about the behemoth mm -hmm. in Job. Job. Yeah, it says his tail is like a cedar. Yeah. And scholars look at that and they go, when you look at the other descriptions, its legs are like trunks. And you might think, well, that would be an elephant. But then it says his tail's like a cedar. Well, that's a big tree. An elephant's got a little ropey tail. Yeah. So I think, well, there were some brontosauruses and dinosaurs that had big legs and long tails like a cedar. And so some have wondered if uh, they were referencing uh, some of the prehistoric or extinct great lizards. And Leviathan he's mentioned also in the book of Job. Yeah, Leviathan. Talking is about a, a sea, sea creature. creature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some kind of big animal. 
Uh, another question that we have is, um, what about sad memories here on this earth? Will we remember those in heaven? No, you know, and I think all of us, even after we repent of our sins, we ask God to forgive us, we may still be reminded by the devil here. And, you know, we wince and we think about things we've said or done. Uh, I don't think you're ever going to have that once we enter eternity because we are going to believe that God forgave us. And if God forgave us, then we should forgive ourselves. And we're going to, it's like you're born again. You're a new creature. Mm -hmm. He's made you new. So that old person that did those terrible things doesn't live anymore. That's the only way I can cope with my past is I say, well, that person's dead and gone. I'm a new person now. Mm -hmm. And that's the wonder of a new birth. You get a whole new beginning. So friends who are listening, no matter what you've done in your past, you can be a new person, be born again. That's what Jesus said. Unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Somebody asks, I can understand the need for a new earth, but why will there need to be a new heaven? Yeah, they may not have heard, uh, they may have written that question down before we talked a little about that in the presentation, that uh, the word heaven, when it says, I'll make a new heaven, it's talking about the atmosphere. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says the heavens dissolve with a great noise. Well, that's talking about the atmosphere. You know, now when you see the flash of lightning that moves the speed of light, then what, five seconds later, you hear the sound, and that's all happening in the atmosphere. So when it talks about the heavens pass away with a great noise, there's going to be lightning, Jesus said, from the east to the west when he comes. That atmosphere is going to be purified, made new, the whole atmosphere changed with sin. Before the days of Noah, it never rained. Obviously, things were different. And many Bible scholars believe the oxygen levels were higher. Even the fossil record tells us creatures were much bigger. Mm -hmm. They had beaver, 13 feet tall. I, I read, uh, someone just sent me a, a, an email today that they discovered a, um, an Arctic bird that had like a, an eight-foot wingspan and much bigger than an albatross. And uh, so you're, they were like small planes back then. Mm -hmm. Everything got smaller. The atmosphere changed. God is going to restore it to that invigorating, healthful atmosphere before contamination with sin. Okay. Somebody, asks, somebody else is asking, what kind of jobs will we do on the new earth? Well, I, I, my job is going to be explorer. Um, but, you know, I love building. It says we're, we're going to... Um, build houses and inhabit them. And uh, so everybody is, God intended people to be different. And one thing you're going to notice, there are 12 gates in the New Jerusalem and all the gates have a different name above them. And there are 12 foundations. And on the high priest's breastplate, he had 12 stones by his heart that represented the different tribes of Israel. And they were all different. God's made us all different. And you know, if you ask about what different combinations can you have with 12 numbers, you get almost an infinite number of different variety and combinations. And so everyone's going to be unique. We're going to have unique gifts, unique desires, and unique skills, doing all kinds of things. I think we're going to be creating. God's a creator. Mm -hmm. We were made in his image. We're going to make things and create things, and it's going to be wonderful. Okay, we have another question. This is an eight-year-old. He says, how do I know that my sins are forgiven? Well, first I'd say, repent of your sins. Tell God you're sorry. Confess your sins to him. And then say, Jesus, I know you died for my sins. Will you please forgive me? The Bible promises, he says, if we ask him, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will do it. Believe him, and he will. If you make a mistake, ask him to forgive you again. He'll pick you up, and you just keep walking with the Lord, and you'll learn to do better all the time. Another question that we have is, how long will the journey take from earth to heaven after Jesus comes? Now, we haven't gotten to this verse yet, but there is a verse that talks about silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. And you'll learn as we progress with the seminar, we're going to talk about interpreting prophecy in prophetic time. And in prophetic time, a day is a year. And a lot of scriptures bear that out. And if a day is a year, then one twenty-fourth of a day, it would be, uh, one, one, yeah, one twenty-fourth would be 15 days, a twenty-fourth of a year. And so uh, half of that would be about seven. So some have wondered, well, does that mean that it takes God about seven days to come and retrieve the redeemed and bring us back? Maybe he takes us on a tour along the way back to heaven. I don't think anyone will be in a hurry mm -hmm. at that point. So, but that's been 
one speculation. Yeah, that's Revelation chapter 8, the opening yeah. of the seventh seal. Yeah. Silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Another question that we have is, um, uh, what about marriage in heaven and children? Will our families be united? You know, when Jesus says, and he says this in, in Matthew, I think it's in Mark 2, they were asking him questions about uh, the resurrection and they created a scenario of this uh, woman that had married several brothers and who will she be married to in heaven? Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures or the power of God, but those who are worthy to obtain the resurrection neither marry nor are they given in marriage. People hear that and they think, no marriage in heaven. Does that mean that everyone that gets to heaven gets divorce papers? So now these are two different questions. No marriage in heaven means there are no new marriages because, well, there's no procreation in heaven because the earth would soon be overpopulated pretty quick if, you know, we live forever. Um, but that doesn't mean Adam and Eve get divorce papers when they get there. So if you're married to your best friend, you're going to get to stay with your best friend in heaven. Mm -hmm. But you may not be procreating. And when I do a week of prayer with teenagers and they ask that question, they get really worried. They say, I'm not married yet. I don't want Jesus to come until I get married. <laughs> and I said, you get to heaven. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Because here in this life, we think, you know, one of the high points is if I can get married and experience love and you get to heaven, I promise you won't be disappointed. Mm. All right. Uh, this is probably another child asking the question, maybe a grown up too. Will my pet be in heaven? Depends on if he was a good pet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, this is a good question. It's uh, close to uh, the hearts of many. We've had uh, animals that we love. Karen and I had a dog for 16 years. It becomes part of the family. And uh, you want to know, am I never going to see them again? Well, there's no specific verse I can point to except the one that says um, that he's got a lot of surprises for us. You know, it hasn't even entered into our minds what he's prepared for those that love him. Uh, it certainly is possible for God to resurrect your favorite dog or cat or horse, whatever your animal is, and have them with glorified bodies in the kingdom. He can do that. Uh, I just promise again, get there. I guarantee you won't be disappointed. You might find your favorite parakeet is hanging there outside your mansion. Not in a cage, though, because <laughs> they won't need it then. Okay, uh, I think you might have mentioned this in your presentation, Pastor Doug, but maybe you want to repeat it. The question is, I've heard about three heavens. Is that true? Yeah, but the third heaven, as I mentioned, you've got the atmosphere is the first heaven around the earth. That's going to be made new, pure. The second heaven is talking about where the sun, moon, and stars are. God populated that on the fourth day of creation. Then you have the dwelling place of God, where we talk about paradise, or the, where God's throne is, where his holy of holies is. You know, some Christian astronomers think it's off in the constellation Orion somewhere, because Orion is mentioned at least twice in the Bible. Um, that's the third heaven, the presence of God, the paradise of God. So, yes, it doesn't mean that we're going to have you know, one heaven for people that drive a Pinto, and then you got a heaven for, you know, the Mercedes, and then there's a Lamborghini heaven and a Bugatti heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and the heaven that gets recreated would probably be the first heaven, the, the atmosphere. atmosphere around okay. the earth. Uh, another question that's coming, it says, uh, what replaced the sanctuary here on earth after the destruction in 70 AD? Good question. We actually have a lesson coming on that, so I won't say too much. But keep in mind, Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will raise it up. I'll make one without hands. And he spoke of his body. Mm. But then the church is called the body of Christ. Uh, Paul said, don't you know that ye are a temple of God? And Paul also says that um, we are uh, living stones. Peter also, we are living stones. We are a royal priesthood in that temple of God. And so the Lord still has a temple on earth in his people and in our bodies. He wants to dwell in us as individuals and the body of Christ is a temple also. So the Lord does, in a sense, still have a temple on earth. But we got a lesson. We've given you more detail. You might have questions about the temple in Jerusalem being rebuilt. Write them in and keep watching. Okay, we'd like to remind our friends about our free offer for tonight. It's a book called Heaven, Is It For Real? And we'll be happy to um, provide this for you. You can actually download it at the Revelation Now website or you can text the word REAL R-E-A-L, to the number 40544 if you're in North America. And you'll be able to get a digital download of the book, Heaven, Is It For Real? It's filled with great information. Again, if you're outside of North America, you can download this for free 
at revelationnow.com. Now, Pastor Doug, we don't have a program tomorrow evening. That's right. Thursday evening. But we will be meeting again on Friday evening at 7 p.m. Pacific time. It's going to be an important presentation. I know each of these presentations have been building up. We've been laying a foundation. We're going to get into some of the deeper prophecies and themes in Revelation, the prophetic passage of the Bible. So Friday night, folks need to make sure that they tune in, that they participate in this. Uh, The topic is going to be the rest of our work. Yeah. So it's an intriguing title. And folks who did tune in, you'll be surprised. This is a prophetic message. We're, we're, delving, be dealing yes, with we're delving into some of the area that deals with uh, the mark of the beast and the seal of God and some of those issues. And friends, you know, th- this is really an industrial strength seminar. We're just giving you a couple of nights off. We're giving you election day off next week. We think that's very important. But we're going to be meeting uh, almost every day through November 14 is our last presentation, talking about the high points. If you missed anything, you should have missed these other meetings. Yeah, the You don't want to miss anything come. from here on is the most important material. And uh, I promise you that you're going to learn things that are just going to really enrich your life. We've had about 700,000 people so far mm-hmm. online that have been watching. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're hoping that number grows. And so tell all your friends, tell strangers, go to Revelation now and join this program. It's going to make a big difference. Okay, so the next program is going to be Friday evening, and then Saturday morning at 11 a.m. We have a special presentation, so folks don't want to miss that.